Amen. So keep your place in Joshua chapter 10. We're going to start out there this evening, but just a little bit of a, a pretext before we begin um, this evening. So this sermon this evening is going to be the second in a, a sermon series that's going to be ongoing, but this will be the second. I'm calling this series How Stuff Works, I guess is what we'll put it. The category we'll put it on you know, um, our YouTube channel or whatever. Um, the first in this series was, if you remember, the sermon called How the Universe Works. And if you remember that sermon, um, the point of these sermons, you say, what's the point of these types of sermons? The point of these sermons is to show you that, you know, we're living in a day where people will say, oh, you know, religion says this and then science says this, you know, and they're two different things. The point of these sermons is to show you that the Bible is a very scientific book. As a matter of fact, it is the scientific book. And as a matter of fact, it, it used to be, and I'm going to show you a little bit more this evening, it used to be that the people that did understand the Bible were much better at applying science and figuring out, um, you know, the mysteries of the greatest scientist that, you know, the universe has ever known, which is God, who made all these rules and made these universes. So, uh, you know, I would invite you, especially those watching online, if you haven't watched How the Universe Works, Watch that sermon. It'll, it'll help you understand some of the things that we're going to talk about this evening. We're going to dive down a rabbit hole this evening, so we need you to pay attention, or maybe we should say a, a wormhole or a black hole or something like that. But um, let's start out in Joshua chapter 10. But the title of the sermon this evening on that pretext and on that introduction is How Time Works. I want to tell you how time works this evening. Let's look down at Joshua chapter 10, and I want to just kind of get through what's happening in the story. We'll preach through Joshua chapter 10 verse by verse next week, but basically in Joshua chapter 10 in the first four verses, we have um, these five kings getting together, and they band together as we saw that kings were starting to do in Joshua chapter 9, and they decide that, you know, we probably can't beat Joshua and the children of Israel, so let's go beat up on the Gibeonites who've made peace with Joshua. We can't beat them, but let's try to beat their friends. So they go and they attack um, the Gibeonites, and look at um, verse number 5. Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their hosts, their armies, and they encamped before Gibeon, and made war against it. So there's this huge conglomeration of these five nations that comes up against Gibeah. So, I mean, when you look at it from the perspective of, you know, the Israelites coming in to conquer these nations, you know, you can kind of see that there's an opportunity here. These kings are all together, and they're now coming all at once. Before it was just one city after another city, here you have these five kings and their armies banding together. And you'll see that God gets a little bit more invested in this opportunity that the Israelites have. So the men of Gideon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. So they send to Joshua, verse 7. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. So all these five kings come at once, this huge opportunity, and here comes Joshua to meet them, to defend Gibeon, but more importantly, to just defeat these five kings in one shot. Look at verse number 8. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. God says, I will not let a single man escape. I mean, that's some confidence right there when God says to you, you know what, you've got this, I'm right behind you, I will make sure that they are all defeated before you. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night, and the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them all the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Azekah and unto Makeda. And it came to pass as they fled from, from before Israel, and they were going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down. Now it's interesting because in verse number 8 he said, There shall not a man stand of them before thee. He's like, None of, nobody's going to get away. And then look what God does in verse number 11. They're getting away. They're fleeing away. And the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Ezekah, and they died. And there were more which died. Now let's see who did a better job in the battle here. There were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. So look, here they're at the, in this battle, and these, these, these kings, they're all retreating. Joshua has won the battle. And God 
creates this huge hailstorm that just kills all the rest of them. And it was the majority of these armies that God killed with the hail. And he killed more of them with the hail than Joshua slew with the sword because they immediately ran away. Now look at verse number 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, listen to this, listen to the confidence of Joshua here. He's in this battle and he says to the children of Israel, he says to God in front of the children of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hastened not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So here's something like just extraordinary happens. Joshua asked God to stop the sun and the moon. So the sun and the moon, you know, they go together, if you, if you, you know, if you've ever paid attention, okay? But, you know, the moon goes down, the sun comes up, and then, you know, it reverses itself, right? But God literally makes them both stand still for the span of 24 hours, it says. So Joshua can have more time to defeat, he can have more daylight. He can have more light to defeat this enemy completely. So God, God stops the clock, is what God did here. So that brings us to the topic of our sermon, and we're going to leave Joshua chapter 10 right here. But that brings us to the topic of our sermon this evening, which is how time works. We see this extraordinary event happen in Joshua chapter 10, where God, it's the only time in the Bible where God literally stops the sun for 24 hours. God's done something similar, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but this was the most significant event as far as God stopping His clock in the Bible. So let's look at how time works, because guess what? The Bible tells us how time works. The Bible tells us everything that we need to know about time, and the Bible tells us, you know, what it is, who it belongs to, what it's for, the whole thing, all the answers, and that's what we're going to talk about this evening. And then we'll look at what man thinks about time, and we'll look at what the consequences are that man thinks that about time. So let's look first at what is time. If we want to know how something works, we need to know what it is. You want to know, you know, how your car works, you want to know how your toaster works, you need to know what it is first. You know, what's the point of this thing? What is time? Let's start at the beginning. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 14. God, of course, is speaking the entire universe, everything that we know. He's speaking the creation into existence in Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse number 14. Super important verse in the Bible right here. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and then let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Notice the purpose given here for the solar system, the universes, is what, what um, God is talking about here. Men, look, men have wasted their whole lives barking up the wrong trees on what the point of the universe and the solar systems and all these stars and planets, what the point of them is for. But look, I'm going to show you tonight that they should have just started with the Bible. And they would have known. Look, the Bible tells us here that there's three specific reasons for, you know, the sun, the moon, the planets. They have three purposes. The first one is for signs. We've talked about this. God is going to use the solar system and the stars, the moon, the sun, the planets as signs to show us what's going to happen for the things that he calls out in the Word of God. The second thing is for the seasons. It's for the seasons. It's so we can, we can I don't know, live. It's so we can live. We can survive. Things can grow. So there's a rainy season and a winter, and, you know, moisture can store itself up in the mountains and come down for the other seasons. So the water cycle, we've talked about this as well. So the water can refresh itself for us every single year. So we see it's for signs, 
It's for seasons. And then, look at number three. This is the important one that we're going to talk about. They're all important, but this is the one that we're going to talk about this evening. And for days and for years, he says. Turn to Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 3. You know what that means? And for days and for years, you know what that means? Time. It means time. Turn to Genesis chapter 6 and look at verse number 3. Look what the Bible says. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. See how there's days and years? This is God using... So God, look, God created the solar system, the planets, the stars, the entire universe, as a clock for timekeeping. Did you know, you're like, what? You're like, what? Did you know the most advanced clock that we have today? Think of all the things we invented today. The atomic clock. Do you know that the atomic clock today that is invented, the cesium clock that literally moves on the vibrations of an atom, has to be periodically adjusted for solar time. Solar time. You know what solar time means? You'll hear this scientific term, solar time. Solar time. You know what that means? God's time. That means it needs to be adjusted slightly every single year to match God's clock. That's what it means. The definition of a day. You know who that belongs to? It belongs to God. The definition of a day. Look, the rotation of the earth and the sun around each other you know, every 24 hours. You know, the spin of the earth that you were taught in school, if you were ever taught that. Look, that is a day. That's what a day is. That's God's clock. The, the orbits of the planets. You know, the sun and the moon and the earth and all these orbits. As they go around each other, that's a year. That's the seasons. This is solar time. Now, that has already been set in motion. It's interesting how all this matches the Bible when you talk about a day and times, and when you talk about a year and seasons, it all exactly matches in the Bible. The point I'm trying to make is, is that our current most technological basis for measuring time is based on God's clock. It's that simple. You say, God's clock? You're skeptical. You don't believe the Bible. Somebody watching. You say, God's clock? Well, I mean, has anyone else stopped it before? Has anyone else stopped the clock besides God? Look, God stopped the clock here in Joshua chapter 10, but he's done it before. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 20. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 20. He did it again in the Bible. Look at 2 Kings chapter 20. As Hezekiah was sick, and Hezekiah was praying to God that he would not die. He was, he was asked for a sign, and Isaiah said that he would, God would show him a sign. And here's the sign that he was to get. Look at 2 Kings chapter 20. Look at verse number 9. And Isaiah said, This sign shall thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he hath spoken, shall, meaning heal you. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees? Meaning the shadow. You know, if you stand in one place during the day, your shadow will move as the sun moves across the sky. Okay? Look, he's saying, should it go forward or just go backwards? And Hezekiah answered, it's a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. He's like, it always moves this way. He's like, let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. And Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. So where did the shadow come from? So what happened if his shadow moved backwards? If your shadow normally would go like this as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and your shadow typically would move this way, and your shadow moves the other way, God moved the sun. God moved the clock. God took the clock and he backed it up 10 degrees in this story. God controls his clock. God controls his clock. Now look, did, did God in Joshua chapter 10 and even in Hezekiah chapter, uh, in, in 2 Kings uh, chapter 20, did God stop time itself? It did, you know, this is where, where stupid sci-fi comes in and I'm going to tell you where all that came from too. But did everybody in Joshua chapter 10, when God set the, did everyone freeze? Were they all like, 
And then Joshua just went around like, <laughs> you know, no. God just gave him, he stopped the solar system so he could have more daylight. Same thing here. Hezekiah didn't all of a sudden start going like, you know, I mean, look, that, that's science fiction stuff. God simply stopped his mechanical clock of the universe here, okay? He simply stopped the solar system for a practical reason in Joshua chapter 10. But look, all the gears are connected, folks. The clock is his, is the point I'm trying to make, okay? But what about time? What about time? God didn't stop actual time, right? Who controls time? Let's look at that now. The Bible actually tells us that too. Who controls actual time? So we see that there's a big physical mechanical clock of the solar system that God has put in place. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 8. Let's look at who controls actual time itself because the Bible talks a lot about this. Who controls it? Hint, it's not or ever going to be us. I hate to give it away, but it's not going to be us. Look, we're going to look and I'm going to prove to you that we will never be able to control time. I'm going to prove to you from the Bible, and I'm also going to prove to you from the world, from the things that we can see in the world. You're like, whoa. Because if somebody doesn't believe the Bible and they listen to a message like this, look, I'll prove it to you from just what we see in the world, that we will never control time. Joshua, or Jeremiah chapter 8. Look at Jeremiah chapter 8, and look at verse number 7. We're going to do some, we're going to do a lot of flipping the Bible here. There's a lot of Bible on time. Look at Jeremiah 8, and verse number 7. The Bible says, Yea, the stork in heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and, and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. Look, here's what God is saying here. Turn to Psalm chapter 31 while well, I explain this. Here's what God is saying about times. He's saying, look, the birds know where they're supposed to go at what time. He's like, the birds know when to go south and when to go this way and when to go that way. You know, birds migrate. You ever wonder where, I mean, how they know to do that? I've thought about that my whole life. They just all of a sudden, they just, I mean, you'll wake up one morning, it'll be duck season, it'll be crazy duck town in North Dakota, and the next day, they're all gone. Just like that. And we're like, guess duck season's over. Because they just know, they all go together. They all know when to go. And God's saying here, the birds know. It's like, you have no idea though. It's like, you don't know when my judgment comes. We'll get to that in a minute. So basically, God is saying here that my judgment is coming at a certain what? A certain time. He's like, you're not going to know when it is. It's like, the birds know where to go, at what time to go. He's like, you're not going to know when my judgment comes. Turn to Psalm chapter 31. And you know what he's saying in the context? What's he talking about? Who are we talking about here? We're talking about Jeremiah. He's like, get right, get right, get right. He's like, you're going to be invaded. You're going to be taken over. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. He's like, look, if you knew that it was going to, if you knew judgment was going to be in three years, you think you'd be getting right today? He's like, you don't know what time judgment's coming. It could be coming now. He's like, get right. God wants it that way on purpose. And that's what Jeremiah was telling the people. Look at Psalm 31, verse 15. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. Turn to Acts chapter 1. He's saying, my times, meaning my days and my years, are in whose hand? God's hand. He's saying, my days and my years, the time that I have on this earth, is in God's hands. I don't even know many people out there soul winning that you could actually bring that up to that would argue with that. Which is so funny that people have gotten so stupid today. Because most people would say, most people when you're soul winning at the door, and you say, look, do you know if you're going to live another day? They're like, no. Like, you could die in five minutes, right? Yes. The youngest kid will tell you that. A teenager will tell you that at the door. Yet we're just dumb. We'll get to that in a minute. My times, your hand, God. God controls it. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse number 7. And he said unto them, it is not for you. Underline that. Underline that, those words. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons. Well, who is it to know then? It's not for me to know. What, does nobody know? Just keep reading. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons. See it? Times, seasons. See how it's all just perfectly just matches up everything? 
for which the Father hath put in his own power. Look, God knows the time. God knows the seasons. Not you. Look, the world itself is on a countdown. That's what the Bible is saying. The world itself is on a countdown. Turn to James chapter 4. Your life is on a countdown. Your life is on a countdown. And guess what? You don't know when zero is coming. And God wants it to be that way. He doesn't want you to know that. Look at James chapter 4 and verse 14. James chapter 4 and verse 14. Whereas you know not what shall be on, to, on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth. For, what do you mean it's a vapor? What does that even mean? It means that it appeareth for a little time. Amen. And then vanisheth away. Go to, go to 2 Samuel chapter 14 and I'll just read for you Job chapter 7. It says, you don't know. Look, you don't know. God doesn't want you to know. If God wanted you to know, he would let you know. If God wanted saved people to know, he'd let you know. He'd have told you in his word. But he doesn't want you to know. Look at second, uh, let me read you for uh, Job chapter 7 and verse number 7. Oh, remember that my life is a wind. My, even Job knew. He's like, my life is like a wind. I don't know when it's going to start and stop. 2 Samuel chapter 14, look at verse 14. For we must needs die. And now this is really interesting. I, I don't know how many times you've read this verse, but it's super interesting when you think about it. We must needs die. It's like we're going to die. I hate to depress you, but you're going to physically die. And are as water spilt on the ground. But look at, the, look at the, the next words. Which cannot be gathered up again. You know what that says? You know what that says? It means, it means that time when it goes by, it's like you can't get that back. You can't gather that back up again. You know, look, God is using time in the Bible. He doesn't allow us to control it. He says it's in my hand. We don't know when the times are going to come. We don't know when his judgment is coming. He uses time to motivate us, is what God is doing here. It can't be, look, it can't be stopped. It can't be slowed down. And it can't be gotten back. Look. There's no time travel. We're never going to be able to travel back in the past or the Bible's not correct. You're not going to be able to travel back in the past and redo things. Look, the world itself, turn to Matthew chapter 24, the world itself is on a countdown. God has put this whole thing together. He's got this massive physical clock running he stopped it a couple times for specific reasons, for a few hours. But he's got this massive physical clock in motion, and it is literally counting down his creation. Think about that. Think he's going to let us travel back in it and control his... It's, it's, it's silly to even think about such a thing. Just from a biblical perspective. I mean, all the things that God is telling us, time is to motivate us. Time is His. He controls it. We don't. We're to do what we can with whatever He gives us in that category. It certainly is His, not ours. Look at Matthew chapter 24. And not only do we have a countdown, that the world is on a countdown, but He gives us clues so we can watch that countdown. Look at Matthew 24 and verse number 7. Remember the sermon on clues and milestones? He gives us clues. Look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 7. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. These are all, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Look, these are clues. These are clues that we should be watching for that will tell us where we're at on the clock. And look, the clues are just, that's what they are. They're clues. There's nothing that you can really just say, oh, there's a pestilence. This is the end times. It's just a clue. It's something that's put there so we can notice things. Earthquakes, famines, pestilences, wars. There's always wars, but they're clues. They're clues for us to notice, folks. Now there's milestones, right? There's milestones that we talked about. Milestones like the Antichrist, that's a milestone. We hit that one. Some guy stands in a newly built temple and declares himself to be God. Okay, milestone. We're marking that one down. There's the mark of the beast. 
There's tribulation. I mean, that could even kind of be a clue, but then there's the great tribulation. I mean, these, these are milestones, but they're milestones and clues to show us where we're at what? The, to show us where we're at on the timeline of the countdown. Does that make sense? It's, it's a timeline. And time itself and this timeline is his. It's his. Tick, tick, tick. It's, it's, it's going by and we cannot stop it, slow it, or reverse it. You follow me so far? Enter Albert Einstein. 1905. In 1905, Albert Einstein publishes a, the theory of special relativity in which time is variable. He makes time variable. He makes time something that we can control by how fast we accelerate a vehicle, how fast we can travel, all these things, you know, by gravity itself, is time is a variable. And I'm not going to look, I don't have the time or the scope, we can talk about it after to get into the actual theory itself, but time he makes a variable. He spurred this idea that we can one day and we'll be able to control, manipulate, or possibly even travel through time. And look, many science fiction books, movies, propaganda, whatever that have been after this point have been based on what Albert Einstein postulated in 1905. Now I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you this evening how I know the theory of special relativity is false and general relativity that came later. That one's false too. I'm going to show you from the Bible and I'm also going to show you from the physical world. This is, I'm going to show you how stupid science today has gotten. You're like, that's a pretty big statement you just made. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad to stand behind it. I've looked into this a lot in the last 20 years. I'm going to show you how stupid science today has gotten. And I'm going to show you, when I quote things, I'm going to, I'm going to quote things from liberal websites and liberal propaganda uh, that love Albert Einstein. Okay, here's from Wikipedia on the theoretical time machine, a theoretical time machine that could work based on Albert Einstein's theory in 1905. Here's what Wikipedia says, okay? If you had a, spher a spherical shell with a diameter of five meters, okay? So roughly 15 feet. Uh, a spherical shell, 15 feet in diameter, containing, look, if you had, this is saying how you can make a time machine on Wikipedia. You can, you can find out how to make a time machine on Wikipedia. All you have to do is this. You get yourself a spherical shell, you know, a round ball. Think of a big rubber bouncy ball that's 15 feet wide, containing roughly the mass of Jupiter. Oh, I was gonna build this in my garage later. A person at its center, it continues, a person at its center will travel forward in time faster than distant observers. Okay, so you first have to build a 15 foot spherical ball and put Jupiter inside there. And then look, then it, it continues and it says this, it says this statement, I'm serious, this is quote, quoting the article on a time machine. This is a direct quote, and it's not a joke. It's not a joke. Squeezing the mass of a large planet into such a small structure is not expected to be within humans' capabilities in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, this is what is wrong with science today. Okay, look, this is how Stephen Hawking spent his life. What a waste. What a waste. He spent his life thinking about how to shove Jupiter into a five-gallon bucket. That's this, I'm not making this up. This is real. This is real. Look, I have crossed paths with this scientific community several times in the last 20 years of my career, and I'm telling you, this is where they're at. This is where they're at. I have worked with engineers that are wor they're working on, pro I mean, can you imagine the pressure? Can you imagine, I mean, look, I've worked with engineers trying to figure out how to, how to make high pressure steam fit into vessels that we can't, look, we literally hit walls of technology in this world where we cannot manufacture materials that are strong enough to contain the pressures that we can create. 
We, I mean, because we can make machines more efficient if we can make these materials stronger and contain higher pressures. And look, these engineers are creating, every single year, these engineers are creating different alloys. And they're getting better and better and better. They can create alloys that can create thousands of PSI inside a vessel. And then the next year, somebody comes up with another special alloy using minerals from the earth that can create, that can hold higher pressures. It's brilliant. And then we have the people at the university talking about putting Jupiter in a coffee cup. I mean, it's, it's maddening. It's maddening. But this is where they're at today. Look, thermodynamics, which we talked about in the first, se the first sermon in this series, how the universe works. Look, that was created by men like, and I'm going to contrast the difference between the men. It was created by men like, by, like Sadie Carnot. Like, like Lord Calvin, or Kelvin, I guess it should be called, Rudolf Clausius. These are like the fathers of thermodynamics. These men, you say, who's Sadie Carnot? Well, you know, if you drove a car here today, you benefited from him because he basically created the study of thermodynamic cycles. And that's how your car runs, on a thermodynamic cycle. Many of these men that you will find Many of these men, many, many, many of these men that I just named were professing Christians. I'm not saying they were saved. I don't know what their doctrines were. I don't know what their theology were. But to the man, they acknowledged God. To the man, they acknowledged that they were all that they were doing was trying to figure out the laws that God put in place. Let me give you a quote from William Thompson Kelvin, or better known as Lord Kelvin, if you ever look up or read books on him. He's one of the fathers of thermodynamic theory. This is a quote from him. I have long felt that there was a general impression from the non-scientific world that believes science has discovered ways of explaining all the facts of nature without adopting any definitive belief in a creator. I have never doubted that impression was utterly groundless. He says, I've never doubted that impression was utterly groundless. So that, that science, he says, there's all these people that are non-scientific that are out there. And, and they think that the scientist is trying to explain away God. And he says, he's one of the most successful, look, he has given us, he has given us machines today that run our world, this man in 18, the late 1800s, and he said, that is groundless. And then look what he says on, on, the, on the topic of time, look what he says. You know who else was coming onto the scene around this time, by the way? A man named Charles Darwin. He said, so Lord Calvin said that the non-scientific community is starting to think that we're trying to explain away God. He says, that's groundless. And then on time, look what he says. One of the smartest men in history says this, we feel that there is no possibility of things going on forever as they have done for the last 6,000 years. Do you understand what this man gave us? This man just said that there's no way things will keep going on forever as they have for the last 6,000 years. He didn't say 2 billion years. He said 6 thousand years. If you think that the earth is 6,000 years old today, people will call you an idiot. Amen. I believe that the earth is just a little over 6,000 years Amen. old today. Amen. Because that's what the Bible says. But that's what he also said. And you know what's funny? You know what's funny? You know what this man gave us? You know what, what William Rudolph Kelvin gave us? He gave us the second law of thermodynamics, which basically proves mathematically that the earth cannot go on forever. Mathematically. You can prove mathematically that the earth cannot go on forever. See how the universe works. That's what this man gave us. And he saw it. And that, look, he unlocked that secret. God unlocked it for him. Look, these men and men like them delivered to the world the things like your car. The things like electricity, the things like basically the physical basis for every machine that we use today. Men like this and the men that I named, they gave us these things. 
They basically invented the modern world. Turn to Romans chapter 1. These men invented the modern world. On the other hand, let me read you a quote from Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, who is literally worshipped today by scientists and the, the university uh, culture and crowd out there today. Albert Einstein, quote, The word God to me is nothing more than the expression and product, product of human weakness. The word God to me is nothing more than the expression and product of human weakness. The Bible, a collection of honorable but still primitive legends which are nevertheless pretty childish. That's not even good grammar. This is Albert Einstein compared to these other men. Turn to Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20. Now I'm going to prove to you not only from the Bible but from the world where all, that this is all wrong. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20. The Bible says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. That's what Lord Kelvin saw. Being understood by the things that are made. You know how I know when a scientist understands the things of creation and he understands God? You know how I, you know, how I know when a scientist understands the world from a biblical viewpoint? He can make things. That's how you know. And you can look at these men, and you can look at the men that followed, like Albert Einstein, and you can judge them by the things that are made. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but become vain. In their what? In their what? In their realities? No. In their imaginations. Man, if this is not Albert Einstein and his children, I don't know what is. And their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Here's how we know he was wrong. Here's how I know he's wrong. I'm showing you from the Bible how I know he's wrong. Here's how I know he's wrong in the world. Nothing has ever been invented by his theory that he came up with in 1905. Nothing. And I'll leave comments open on this YouTube video and somebody can come up and they can, sh they can, they can make a comment on something that they thought Albert Einstein... Look, Nothing, no machine, no materials, relativity, special or general, has nothing to do with satellites. It has nothing, you need to read more if you think that. It has nothing to do with time dilation as an illusion. Find me a clock that doesn't, isn't relying on gravity, and I'll prove that one wrong. Every clock is relying on gravity. Man will never be able to travel through time. Einstein had nothing to do with atomic energy. Nothing. The only patents he ever received were related to a refrigerator that he didn't even invent. He was a patent clerk. He did the paperwork. His student invents a refrigerator and he filed the paperwork. I mean, it is his most credited equation. You're like, oh, what about E equals MC squared? He didn't invent that. That was published in 1889. The equation was actually published by Oliver Heavystein in 1889 and later in 1904 and early 1905 by Fritz Hazelnorl. Publi and he published, this man published a trilogy of papers using the equation called On the Theory of Radiation in Moving Bodies. Here's a quote from the Scientific American on Albert Einstein. Then Albert Einstein publishes it a few months later. In reconciling, this is from the Scientific American, hardly a Christian Docu you know, document or publication. In reconciling this equation with his theory of relativity, Einstein approximated away the relativistic bits, leaving an answer one can derive from purely classical physics. You know what you don't do when you're building a bridge or a building or an airplane or a power plant or anything? You don't estimate away stuff. You don't approximate away things. Einstein was notorious for this approximating things away and massaging numbers to make his theory fit. That's what he just said. And here's another quote from the Scientific American. One wonders on E equals MC squared. One wonders whether Einstein knew of Hazel Dorrell's work. It is difficult to think he did not, given the bulk of the prize-winning trilogy appeared in the most prominent journal of the day. 
Einstein's work is scientific folklore. That's all it is. And it's weird, by the way, how people attribute everything from modern communications to paper towels to Albert Einstein. It is the weirdest thing. It's the strangest thing. But look, he didn't invent this equation. He didn't invent any machines. But look, God has the last laugh. Because professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Scientists used to spend their lives acknowledging God and unlocking his universe. Now we have men like, like you know, Einstein and then his children, like Neil deGrasse Tyson and, you know, Mikio Kaku and all these people. They sit at universities, at universities and they theor theoreticize about putting Jupiter into a coffee cup. Mikio Kaku talks about, like, super alien civilizations. I'm serious. And people are just like, if we, and he's, he'll sit in front of these conferences with thousands of people sitting there, just writing down everything he says, talking about how we need to become like a type three alien civilization. It's stupid. And there's a reason that nothing has ever come from it. There's a reason. Look, here's a statement. I have invented more things than Albert Einstein. You're like, that's pretty prideful to say that. Well, guess what? Go invent one thing, and then so have you. It's crazy. It's crazy. But professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Back to time. God controls time. Time is not a variable. It never will be. God controls it. He uses it. He uses it to manage and motivate us. He uses it to show us the signs, the seasons, the days, the years. Look, it's a tool that he uses, and it's a tool that's in his hand for good reason. I mean, when they, look, when they, look, when they invent the first time machine or they smash Jupiter into a bouncy ball, I, I will retract this sermon. I'll retract it. I'll be like, you know what? I was wrong about that. I didn't think they'd get Jupiter in there. But look, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Look, I have, I have been privileged to see the limits of technology. I've seen the limits of how small we can make a transistor. I've seen the limits. I've seen the limits of wavelengths of light and how we manufacture things. And then I've seen those limits pushed a little further and further and further and further every year. But these guys, they're off in another realm. Science has left the building, folks. We're not going to control time. And God, look, God only, God not only shows it in this world, He shows it in the Bible that He controls time. And look, He continually makes fools of those that mock Him. To believe the theory of special relativity, you literally have to believe that your feet are in the future and your head is in the past. That's how dumb it is. And it makes perfect sense that God is just like, you know what, you mock me? Nothing will, have fun talking about this stuff and having your conferences and talking about alien civilizations and, you know, wormholes or whatever you want to talk about, but nothing will ever come because you've mocked, not, nothing will ever come of it because you mocked me. Amen. And you professed yourself to be wise. And these other men, I love reading about these other men, these past scientists who were just like, you know what, the universe is so great. The more they studied these things, the more they studied the way particles worked and how materials worked together and how heat transferred through different materials, they're just like, this is proof of God. Amen. That's what you'll find from these men before the Albert Einstein. It reminds me of Matthew 7, 18, where basically, you know, a, a, a corrupt tree, just, he, just, he just keeps bringing forth corrupt fruit. That's, that's science today, unfortunately. God controls time, not us. There will never be a time machine. Sorry to break it to you. You'll have to read about it in books, but you probably shouldn't be reading those books anyway. <laughs> Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly